finishing this morning with our words of encouragement from our beloved Reverend John Scott, who never fails to deliver and always gives us an assignment. So we look forward and we invite you, Reverend John Scott, the beloved, to come and thrill us with your words. Welcome. Thank you, Reverend Sonia. Good morning, family. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> A joy to add my own words of welcome to those in the sanctuary and those, as Reverend Sonia always says, on the World Wide Web. Um, so it's a beautiful Sunday morning, and I am so happy to be with you. I'm packing, well, I have been packing for a couple months to change locations. <laughs> There's a lovely story I always tell at Thanksgiving services about changing location. It's about a country carpenter who had an assignment to make a coffin for somebody in a, in a neighboring district. And he, as he finished it late in the evening before the, 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 the funeral, so he put the coffin on the back of his pickup truck and was heading over the hill, chug, chug, chug in his old pickup truck. When halfway up the hill, the pickup gave up the ghost and died, indicating that it too might soon need a, a, a funeral. And not wanting to be late and to disappoint his clients, he hefted the coffin onto his head and continued walking up the hill. Well, as evening was falling and the mist was gathering over the Blue Mountains, soon the flashing blue lights of a police car penetrated the mist. And you know, very often when our police, God bless them, are on, on patrol, you usually have good cop and bad cop. Well, as they drew alongside um, our hero, the, one of them, you can decide which one, said, hey boy, what are you doing with that coffin? And our hero said, well, officer, me never like which part them buried me, so I was changing location. <laughs> well, friends, I was changed location. I, I had, didn't have to die to do it, but I can tell you I was buried under tons of years of paper and coro coro and according to my grandmother, accoutrement. And it's just been a wonderful, freeing experience to let go of an accumulation of some stuff I've not even seen for years. So that brings me to this morning's <laughs> encouragement. I talk about the, the business of um, downsizing and divesting ourselves of baggage at another time. But this morning I wanted to just share with you uh, an idea that came to me. And it, it happened because I, I found in the China cabinet a beautiful uh, ceramic teapot with uh, a bamboo handle and four matching cups that had been made by Jamaican master potter Bo. I've never made a cup of tea in it. Um, it, it well, who makes, who uses teapots anymore? You put a tea bag in a teacup and fill it with boiling water and that's how you, most of us, have our, the days of having tea in teapots are, I think, long gone. So I bought it in an auction. And I can't remember how much I paid for it, but I remember feeling very proud of myself. And when I got home, I was you know, eager to show it to my parents. My mother's brother, my, uh, my uncle Laurie, was visiting. And when I produced this teapot, he, and he said, how much for it? And I, I said, whatever it was I had bid and paid. He said, why would anybody pay that much money for a teapot? So I said, well, uncle, it's, um, it's a work of art. You know, just think of the, the creativity and the, the originality and the artistry that went into forming a clump of clay into a beautiful vessel. He said, that's good, but I drink mine out of a tin can. <laughs> anyway, he wasn't impressed. But my father, God bless him, um, who had, was a bit of a Bible scholar, remembered a story in Jeremiah, and I looked it up when I was writing this, at Jeremiah 18, verse 3 and 4, about a potter who had made a, a vessel and didn't like how it turned out, and so he squashed it all together and made another vessel more to his liking. And I love that idea. I love the idea that particularly in a master potter's hand, a clump of clay can become a beautiful vessel. 
a vessel that perhaps the Creator might fill with grace to overflowing, and that we could pour cups of grace and serve it to all those whom we encounter on life's journey. A master's hand can, can make a, an ordinary piece of music come to life. A master's hand can change a life from something quite ordinary and blah into something extraordinary and beautiful. And so I have named my encouragement this morning the touch of the master's hand. And there's a lovely uh, poem that is written by uh, uh, a woman who is named Myra Brooks Welch. And it is titled, The Touch of the Master's Hand. Before I read it for you, though, I'd like us just to affirm, Father, you are the potter, I am the clay, mold me. Can we say that together? Father, you are the potter, I am the clay, mold me. I just love that image of, of being molded. And you remember that the, the creator looked at us after he had molded us in its image and likeness. And what was his exclamation? Ah, this is good and very good. And that's what is the truth about us, good and very good. And the master potter couldn't make anything but a, a perfect and exquisite pot. So maybe that should be our assignment. Regulars at the Temple of Light know I always give an assignment. So your mission, should you decide to undertake it, is every morning this week, as you awaken, just say, Father, you are the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and fill me with your grace. I just love that image. A beautiful pot filled with the grace of God. So this poem, The Touch of the Master's Hand, is about an auction, which, which has relevance for me since I bought my bow teapot at an auction. I'd like you to listen with your heart. Twas battered and scarred, and the auctioneer thought it scarcely worth his while to waste much time on the old violin, but held it up with a smile. What am I bidding, good folks, he cried. Who'll start the bidding? Who'll start the bidding for me, a dollar? Then two? Who'll make it three? Three dollars once, three dollars twice, going, going, but no. From the room far back, a gray-haired man came forward and picked up the bow. Then wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening the loose strings, he played a melody, pure and sweet, as a caroling angel sings.
the music ceased, and the auctioneer, with a voice that was quiet and low, said, what am I bid for the old violin? And he held it up with the bow. A thousand dollars, and who will make it two? Two thousand, and who will make it three? Three thousand once, three thousand twice, and going and gone, said he. The people cheered, and I think we should cheer Hani. <laughs> but some of them cried, we do not quite understand what changed its worth. Swift came the reply, the touch of a master's hand. And many a man with life out of tune and battered and scarred with sin is auctioned cheap to the thoughtless crowd, much like the old violin. A mess of pottage, a glass of wine, a game, and he travels on. He's going once and going twice. He's going and almost gone. But the master comes, and the foolish crowd never can quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that is wrought by the touch of a master's hand. My friends, the master's hand can change your life in ways that are unimaginable to you at this time. And what I want to leave with you this morning is that no matter what the experience has been in your life, no matter the mistakes you have made, that is not who you are. You are a perfect vessel created by the creator of all things, the infinite invisible source of all power that is unstoppable and unchanging. Just ask that power to use you to its own honor and glory every day in every way. One of our CSL ministers a couple of years ago, and I, I always save interesting stories when they come to me, sent me a story about another kind of touch that made a big difference. It's titled Mama's Gift, and is by Wendy Burt, a freelance writer from Colorado Springs in the USA. She writes, and I quote, the first time I saw a white man, I was sitting in church. It was the middle of August, and the humidity hovered in our Alabama parish like grits in a cast iron kettle. I sat quietly, wedged between Mama and my Aunt Fancy, catching bits of breezes as they fanned themselves with their hard straw fans. The Reverend rambled on, his fire and brimstone sermon seasoned with an occasional hallelujah and praise the Lord from the sweaty audience. I stared out the church window and wandered into a daydream picturing the Sunday dinner we would eat later that day. A Sunday feast was typical for all the families and I reckoned it was God's reward for us having to sit through two hours of preaching. Thank God we don't have to do that at the Temple of Light. But that one summer Sunday, everything changed for me. In the middle of his Bible thumping, fists clenching exuberance, the reverend stopped and the silence engulfed me by surprise. And at first I thought maybe he knew I wasn't listening, as if God had, had, had allowed him to read my mind. And so I looked at the pulpit to see him standing there with an expression of disgust staring at the back of the church as if the devil himself had just entered. With the rest of the congregation, I turned to see the interruption. There, leaning against the front doors of our church, our pure black church, was a drifter, a skinny, disheveled, white drifter. 
This man, this invader of our sacred space, stood before us in all his unholiness. His ragged clothes seemed to hang on him, and his face looked pasty and sunken, like a man waiting for death. Worst of all, he had entered our church barefoot, his blistered, bloody feet staining the holy wood floor. We were still. He walked down the center aisle with slow, deliberate steps. His legs looked fragile and weak, and his hunched back made him look as though he carried the world on his shoulders. P pardon me, Reverend, he said, as he removed his hat and seated himself in the front row. The Reverend looked around the congregation and then at Mr. Jackson, our layman, who barely acknowledged the man before turning away. Looking down at the bloody floor, the reverend shook his head. He glanced at the drifter for just a second and with a roll of his eyes, picked up his sermon where he left off. The man glanced at the stained floor and bowed his head, ashamed. I couldn't take my eyes off him. His skin seemed to drip off him like a wet laundry. I was confused by the reverend's reaction. I had never really listened to any of the Sunday sermons, but the bits that, and pieces that I had picked up had taught me that God wanted us to be kind to others. And yet, here in this place that the reverend called God's house, I was witnessing a stranger in need, being passed over and disrespected. Then to my right, Mama Rose. Clutching her good Sunday kerchief, she walked straight to the church christening bowl. The Reverend stopped speaking. And taking the pitcher of water that the Reverend himself had been drinking from during his sermon, she stepped down to the front pew. Be not ashamed, my brother, said Mama, kneeling in front of the man. I leaned forward and watched as she filled the christening bowl with water, and then, dunking her kerchief, she bathed the man's feet. I could see the man's face as he began to weep. Engrossed in the miracle that I had just witnessed, I had forgotten about dinner by that time. Mama returned to her seat. I had seen Mama through different events and in a different light that day. Like Rosa Parks, who walked to the front of the bus, Mama had challenged the racism that surrounded her. Like Susan B. Anthony taking charge when it was necessary, Mama had showed me the strength of a woman's actions. And like the Good Samaritan helping a stranger in need, Mama had gone to the aid of another in need of human kindness. That hot Alabama Sunday, Mama showed me not only who she was, but who I was. In one day, she set a lifelong example, paving a road for her only daughter to walk down proudly as an African-American as a woman, as a Christian, and I would add, as a human being God's vessel and as a human doing God's work. So my friend, the master's hand can touch, use you to touch, touch through you hearts and minds and consciousnesses and souls in need of compassion of understanding, of forgiveness, of love, of beauty, and of truth. The master's hand can transform every aspect of your life if you will but ask and wait for it to be given. And you don't have to earn that grace the grace that Reverend Sonia wrote, uh, read this morning 
in our inspirational reading. The grace is given without our deserving it, without our earning it. We simply need to say, Father, make me a vessel and fill it with your grace. Can we say that together? Father, Father make, make me your me vessel and fill it with your grace. In a half voice, Father, make me your vessel and fill it with your grace. In a whisper, Father, make me your vessel and fill it with your grace. Now say it in your heart. My friends, each of us can masterfully touch the lives of others, and every day we are presented with many, many opportunities to let God tighten our loose strings and make beautiful music through us. I'd like us to do a brief exercise in self-reflection, which may give us some insight, and that's insight, inner sight, into who we can be to the honor and glory of God if we will let the master's hand touch and guide our lives. And so if it's comfortable for you, I'd like you to gently close your eyes and uncross your legs. And for a few, for a few moments, simply observe your breathing Observe your breath without manipulating it and notice how cool the air is as, as it enters your nostrils and how warm it is as you exhale. And if your mind gets distracted, just gently bring your awareness back to your breathing. And now bring your awareness to the area of your feelings or thoughts to spontaneously come to you as you ask, who am I? And the second question, what do I want? What do I really, really want? Again, allow any images, sensations, feelings, or thoughts to spontaneously come to you. What do I want? Question three, what is my purpose? Why have I come to earth? What is my purpose? And again, allow any images, sensations, feelings, or thoughts to come to you spontaneously. The final question, what am I grateful for? What fills my heart to the brim and overflowing with gratitude at this time in my life? What am I grateful for? So you may want to take this exercise into your daily spiritual practice. Who am I? What do I want? What is my purpose? And what am I grateful for? So to close off our self-reflection, 
Simply say both your names mentally. I would say I am John Scott. Now let go your last name and say just your first name. I am and your first name. And now drop your first name and just repeat the phrase, I am, I am, I am. And now replace the I am statement with the Sanskrit mantra, Aham. Aham, aham, which is the sound of your breath. Aham, ah. And keeping your eyes closed, let go of the mantra and bring your awareness back to your body. Become aware again of your breathing and take a minute or two before opening your eyes. Very slowly, ever so gently, open your eyes and be present here and now. You know, friends, for many of us, life is like a roller coaster. One day you may think of yourself as capable or dealing with life in a wonderful way, and the next you feel totally incapable. One minute you are experiencing the giddy, head over heels exhilaration when you meet with success or fall in love, and the next you experience the extreme 20 story dropper in, in, in energy when someone or something disappoints you. Sometimes we need to get off the roller coaster and just breathe. Ah, um, and remind yourself, I am. I am. I am. Father, you are the potter. I am the clay. Mold me. Make me into a vessel so strong, so beautiful, so deep, and fill it with your grace. Fill it with your love, so that I might offer the chalice of my life to all whom I encounter. That I might be like that old violin that simply needs tuning and dusting off a bit as I allow myself to be touched by the master's hand, knowing that each of us have the stamp, the imprimatur of the infinite invisible, creator of all life, sustainer of all life, and the giver of grace. And so may you this week and every day experience the touch of the master's hand. God loves you and so do I. Namaste. Thank you, thank you, Reverend John. Rich, soul-stirring, moving and memorable presentation. I have been writing and writing and I do intend to give another sermon. <laughs> but I just want you to know that it's very important for you to go to your YouTube channel, our church's YouTube channel, and you can hear it, you can share it, you can like it. There's benefit for you if you go to it and like it because you will get notifications from our church. Whenever anything is happening, you will get it immediately. 
If you share it, you will be giving someone a big blessing, truly. A life-altering blessing. And not only someone, many. Because for everyone that you share it with, somebody is going to share it with others. Many others. And I just wanted to, to say, Reverend John, that the, your, your, both your stories, the one that was humorous in the beginning, right? And the other is so rich with metaphors and with all kinds of things for us to remember for ourselves. And the affirmation, well, we remember the title, The Touch of the Master's Hand, and the affirmation that you start with, Father, you are the potter. I am the clay. Mold me. And when Hanif was playing, another one came to me. Father, you are the master. I am your instrument. Play me. Play me. Because I knew how much it took for Hanif to get to that stage where he could touch that instrument and make it and caress it so that it went straight to our hearts. So remember, this is too rich for just the 20 minutes. Go listen to it again and share it. Thanks again, Reverend John. Oh, beautiful. <laughs>